Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to wait a few more seconds till we tick over to the one o'clock mark, which by my watch is just now. So I'll just wait for uh, any kind of latecomers to, to trickle in and join us. And while we do that, um, I'm just going to uh, run through a couple of um, housekeeping items as well, if I can get my screen to move on. Um, yeah, thank you for joining us today for the, the, this session on uh, the introduction to the trustee recruitment service. Delighted to have so many of you with us today. Uh, and I hope that you find the, the session so far this morning from the conference um, really useful and really informative. Uh, as with all of the other sessions at conference, we are recording this. You should be able to see the screen recording. So we are, uh, all of those recordings will be sent out post uh, event for you in the next kind of day, a uh, few days or a week or so, dependent on the technology and turnaround time. So just to make sure everyone's aware of that. And secondly, the whole event uh, is accredited by CPD. So if you would like a certificate, uh, we do need your customer's consent. To, uh, to send those certificates out and you should be able to access a survey, a post-event survey once we've finished speaking today. So please do remember to fill that out if you want your, uh, your certificate sent in. We can't do that without your consent. Uh, if you've got any questions for your panellists in this session, your panellist is uh, essentially myself. Uh, if you've got any questions for me during the session, any clarification, any additional detail, uh, use the Q&A function uh, and we'll kind of try and filter those through so that I can provide any answers uh, to questions that come up. Any that we I don't get a chance to answer will obviously follow up post-event to provide lots of clarity and detail. And if for any reason you're disconnected during the session, you can rejoin it just by clicking on the same um, Zoom URL link that you used to access the session uh, initially. And uh, finally, before I get started on the main content today, thanks uh, so much to IUT, Institution of Engineering and Technology, for their support and sponsorship of the conference. Really pleased to have their support to allow us to put this on and, and kind of welcome so many of you to, uh, to, to the sessions that we've gone on over the next couple of days. So I'll get started. A uh, very warm welcome to everyone who's joined me today, joined us. Uh, thank you for signing up for the session on TRS. So to briefly introduce myself, I'm David, David Ardill, Head of Trustee Recruitment at Governors for Schools, and uh, I'm Head of Leading Up the, the Trustee Recruitment Service. I joined the organisation earlier this summer from the Academy Ambassadors Programme. And as, many of you, uh, as many of you will know, Mel will be aware, uh, that programme was closed um, in spring of this year after a decision made by the Trustees of New Schools Network, who previously operated that contract. Uh, they decided not to carry on delivering the contract despite being selected as the preferred bidder for that. So the decision, in, in terms of a bit of scene setting, the decision made there has left the sector quite exposed. Uh, and Governors for Schools uh, recognised the need to start offering a service that could start to support the sector and, and perhaps meet some of the need that still exists. And I'll kind of go into a bit more detail on that uh, later in this presentation now. So kind of bring us back to, to kind of first things first and what is the TRS uh, to kind of explain a little bit about why, why we do what we do and how we do it. Uh, in short, the service is a bespoke one. Uh, we, uh, it was created to help Academy Trust to identify strong independent candidates possessing uh, appropriate skills, expertise and knowledge for their boards. When I say appropriate, I mean that in the sense of both appropriate uh, to fill the gaps that exist on boards in terms of their um, seniority, experience and capability, and also appropriateness in terms of the phase a trust might be in, the particular challenges that a trust is facing. And there's a, a, there's a skill and a, um, an art, I think, in actually finding the right people that are appropriate in every sense for those board roles. So that's that's a big part of why we do what we do in terms of finding the right people uh, and the challenge that those people can bring uh, is pivotal to trust in terms of overcoming challenges and meeting their priorities. To kind of meet head on a very um, important point um, very early on in this session is uh, around the paid for nature of this service. So it is a bespoke service. Um, and we, uh, we we build and run the process according to the needs of the trust. So it isn't a one size fits all model or an off the peg offering. Uh, we recognise that the challenges and the, um, the, the 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 priorities and the challenges of every trust are, are kind of varied and, and simultaneous. And the people that you need to help navigate those challenges um, are kind of are very specific in their profile too. So not only can we help identify those people, but we can help reach them and, and if you want, sell the idea of becoming a trustee. So in terms of the paid for bit of it, uh, there's no way around that at the moment. We understand and appreciate and are really, really sensitive and, uh, and um, recognise the challenges that are facing Academy Trusts and the education sector more broadly in terms of finances uh, and the very sort of sensitive position that, that we're in. Uh, not least given the, the, the fact that the previous service, the dedicated service that was available, Academy Ambassadors, was free at the point of, uh, of access to Academy Trusts. And the expectation that sort of potentially created that the norm for high quality bespoke trustee recruitment service was that it would be free to access. And the crucial point here is that while it was free for trust to access, 
Uh, the cost of running that programme and delivering the service was met centrally by, by government, by the DfE, meaning that trusts could benefit from the service without needing to necessarily uh, invest their own reserves and their own funds into that. So in terms of the TRS, the Trustee Recruitment Service, the absence of, of that current contract uh, to, to, to deliver the service uh, means that we 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 require, um, we, we ask for um, uh, uh, to that fee to be met by trusts and as a non-profit all of the the revenue that's generated from that goes directly back into improving the service and delivering the service and the pricing uh, of the service uh, compares favorably to those offered by executive search companies which might not necessarily some do but not might not necessarily specialize in the education sector so on that point our personnel is rooted in the sector uh, governance for schools has been operating governance recruitment services for more than 20 years and the team responsible specific, specifically for the trs has a rich background in both trustee recruitment and education delivery we're really proud to have amongst our ranks uh, some former head teachers rsc deputy directors and dfe education advisors uh, who their, their knowledge experience expertise in kind of the off the service that we offer uh, really is, is quite sector leading we're really pleased and proud to be able to bring that knowledge to the fore and, and share those skills with you as part of our service and i'll go into a bit more detail around around that uh, later on as well in terms of the tools that we use to find volunteers they're very varied we run some tried and tested recruitment processes to source high caliber senior figures from both education and business sectors we appreciate there's a growing need for uh, education leaders uh, in these trustee roles and whereas previously some of the services may have focused particularly on the business side we're really keen to make sure that the the full sort of range is uh, is offered to trust and where the education leadership is required we can then provide support in that sense as well uh, and we've got some some um, relationships with industry partners uh, that give us access to their senior leadership figures some really household names in industry the likes of Deloitte, Alan Overy and Lloyds to name to name but three we've got really positive relationships uh, and a lot of those those partners will provide really um, high quality uh, individuals for, for trustee roles. Uh, in addition to this, every person who's appointed through uh, the Trustee Recruitment Service gains access uh, to the key. So uh, dedicate modules to equip them on uh, sort of the, the, the knowledge and best practice for, to, to kind of do their roles most um, most um, with, with, to the best of their, their ability. Uh, and all, all candidates who are appointed through us will gain access to the key. So in terms of brand to the trustee recruitment service going on there, so we launched in summer 2022 following the loss of the Academy Ambassadors program. It's a matter of months. It kind of feels very, very recent. Summer, summer 2022, we're a few months on from that, but we've, we've achieved an awful lot uh, already in establishing the service. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, it was uh, it arrived following the, the loss of the Academy Ambassadors uh, program from the sector. To that point, we share a lot of the same principles, priorities, and actually people from AAP. Um, those people who may be uh, are familiar with AAP, who previously worked with Academy Ambassadors, will know that I came from there, and Alan, uh, Anne Casey and Scott Walker were previously uh, the regional advisors with Academy Ambassadors. And I'm really, really pleased to say that they've joined me at Governance for Schools to kind of offer some continuity, the benefit of their knowledge and experience, and actually maintain some of those relationships that we really, really enjoyed having across the sector, uh, and actually some of the insights and intelligence that we're able to kind of bring in, into this uh, service at the TRS. So at the time of speaking, we don't benefit from any government funding to deliver any of the services across Governments for Schools. They operate as part of the non-profit. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is the reason for the cost and structure that I'll talk about later uh, to, to, to kind of support the in-depth trustee recruitment work that we do. It's also important to kind of mention the fact that the new service doesn't supersede, supplant or replace in any way the existing Governments for Schools uh, free offerings for Governor and LGB recruitment. But that service continues as it always did, offering support to any school or trust looking to recruit to that level of governance. And as time goes on, there'll inevitably be some degree of synergy and complementation between those two services as we offer a kind of joined up pathway for volunteer development and the opportunities for candidates. As ostensibly, the two kind of parts of the organisation will operate separate to one another in, in access terms. But really, it's, a, it's a, um, a unique opportunity for us to actually offer pathways for volunteers who maybe have been in a, in a uh, governor role for a little while and want to take on a trustee role for us to kind of maintain that capacity within the sector and enable us to find trustee roles for people who previously had governance roles and develop that kind of knowledge and experience um, through education governance 
A final kind of brief um, point on this slide just to mention is that every role to which we recruit through the service is pro bono and voluntary in nature. So the, these aren't paid for roles. Uh, the, the, the candidates who take the roles are fully aware and expect uh, to, 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 um, to kind of perform the role in a voluntary uh, capacity. So if you, any of you have ever used uh, kind of ambassadors in the past or you're familiar with uh, what the service offered there, um, there's lots of kind of many of the steps and USPs and the processes that we implement through TRS will be familiar to you. They're the things that I personally believe and we believe as an organisation are kind of essential and uncompromisable uh, and core to delivering a quality recruitment process in the education sector. So first of those is an in-depth diagnostic call for every trust which, that we work with. Uh, and that call helps to identify the need and drill down into the areas for our focus recruitment activity. So they, these calls are not just a uh, hi, hello, how are you doing? Let's hear a bit about your trust. They're really proven to kind of inform the process and the search activity and also help focus the minds of the chairs and the members as to the, the what, why, when, where, how of, of their recruitment activity. So it kind of it builds that self ownership and um, and familiarity with with the why of, of each question that we're asking through the the recruitment process, and make sure that the trust or the the trust chair or the members who are, who are leading it kind of feel really involved in that process. As much as it's a managed process from us, we we have to have that kind of ownership from the trust side. It's more than just a chat; it can be a, a practical exercise in kind of honing and sharpening that piece of activity. So throughout the process, we maintain an impartiality, but bring to the conversation our insight and informed perspective. I mentioned Anne and Scott being in the sector for many, many years. I've been involved in um, trustee recruitment for uh, six years or so as well myself. So in terms of our knowledge and expertise, we understand the sector trends and the pressures and the overall landscape knowledge. I mentioned as well around financial challenges at the moment facing trusts. So we've got that realistic, empathetic and, and honesty in the conversations. And we're able to kind of um, empathise uh, and really understand the challenges that trusts are facing to help sort of make use, me help make best use of the time we have with you, but make best use of the opportunity to kind of run the activity, the recruitment activity too. So off the back of those initial conversations, uh, we produce some external adverts and marketing, mat marketing materials where they're necessary to enable us to kind of run the adverts, uh, promote opportunities using a, a variety of external networks and promotional um, platforms. Uh, and those those might not always necessarily be necessary, necessarily be necessary, um, because we do use a lot of headhunt activity and really sharp tools to uh, identify people who are going to be appropriate and suitable for the roles. So we, once we've found those people off the back of adverts or our network engagement with our partners, as mentioned earlier, or headhunting tools to identify suitable people and suitable opportunities, we conduct, conduct an assessment call with every would-be candidate to check their, their suitability, their capability, really, really importantly, their motivation for taking the role. It's really important to us to find kind of sticky appointments so that uh, the person that goes into the trust is doing it for the right reasons. And actually what they want to get from a role is what the trust needs as well. So there's a kind of a, there's a synergy in it and a bit of give and take in there in terms of finding the right role for the right person and not shoehorning the right, uh, the wrong person into a role just to kind of uh, get a bum on a seat, as it were. We do a, a little bit of light touch background checking to ensure that the individuals are suitable for that role. Uh, sort of taking into account all of the the, um, the diagnostic process that we did at the very beginning of, the, uh, of our steps. So we have at our disposal a suite of what I like to call sharp tools. So each capable of kind of cut, kind of labour and analogy, cutting to the uh, heart of an issue, identifying the right people or persons, depending on your requirements for roles. They're really targeted and effective and proven to find good people with the right profile skills and knowledge. We use a platform called LinkedIn Recruiter, which um, really enables us to harness one a, a massively powerful um, database of individuals across all of England uh, to, to identify people with the right motivation, skills and knowledge and experience. And that's proven really, really helpful for us to, um, to kind really help trusts across the board. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, so the trust comp uh, the service complements the existing governor pathway and where individuals are seeking trustee roles or they're looking to progress or take on additional voluntary roles, we can help keep them in the sector and can continue to, to continue, uh, continue to contribute um, building system capacity ultimately. Likewise, any applicants who come into us seeking a trustee role who maybe for whatever reason might not be quite suitable for a trustee role, we're able to kind of keep them within the Governors for Schools organisation. We can refer them on to Governor Opportunities and that offers that joined up proactive suite of opportunities and options that maintains interest in the sector, builds, builds knowledge and capacity as well. So we really see this service as being 
as much as it's complementary to the governor role, it sort of really helps to sort of generate more capacity across the whole system. Broadly speaking, who, who can we support? Broadly speaking, um, we can support any academy trust regardless of size or location or phase. We don't have any uh, limitations as academy ambassadors previously did on supporting trusts above a certain size. So we can support any trust of any size uh, depending on your kind of requirements and what you're looking for. We are focused, however, on those trustee and member positions. And that kind of goes to that earlier point made around LGB and LA maintained governor roles can continue to access the Governor Recruitment Service that's free at the point of delivery, and that's provided by my excellent colleagues across Governors for Schools. So that kind of part of what we do is still in place and will continue to be in place. Just a final point there as well, we don't currently recruit to uh, independent schools or universities, so just an important point to, to kind of um, highlight there. So I've talked a lot about finding the right people with the right profile, the right skills, knowledge and experience, but what that mean actually in terms of the sorts of people you can expect to uh, welcome to your boardroom or interview for roles that have come through our trustee recruitment service so i kind of want to go a little bit uh, in, into what a good trustee might look like so this list is indicative rather than exhaustive and i wouldn't necessarily expect every individual we we source to have all of these characteristics or traits but it gives an idea of, of what somebody might look like uh, that comes across our desk and that we would assess to be potentially a good trustee so we look for seniority, those people who've held a role for uh, at least 10 years, usually at a high level within a company or of at least a company of at least the same size and revenue and scale uh, to the trust to which we're, we're helping recruit. They'll be comfortable and familiar with the level of challenge necessary and at ease at a, in a senior leadership role. Ideally, we love to see evidence of individuals operating at a board level or an equivalent position or of strate senior strategic strategic. <laughs> strategic decision making depending on the size and scale of their organization we often find we'll get people from multinational companies massive organizations that where it's unrealistic to expect that individual to have sat at board level so we do that assessment part of the skill in what we do is assessing that candidate's capability through both initial desk-based assessment of their cv and application and our advisor call where we do that assessment as well to make sure that their knowledge and set of um, competencies is is really suitable for taking on a board role in, in education very often candidates will have an industry qualification, so the likes of ACCA, SEMA, CIPD, ICE, dependent on the sector and the sort of skills that they bring, um, they, they, they may, may well possess some industry qualifications, which is always good to see. It's not a prerequisite for the roles, but it can be a good measure of, of a good candidate. We'll always see candidates with experience uh, working across multiple sites, areas, geographies, or locations. It's one of the key aspects of the people we source. They must be comfortable adopting that kind of multi-site mentality and viewing the complex multitude of challenges that exist across a trust. Obviously, we, we, we work with SAP, we work with individual schools, but having that ability to kind of think across site, multi-site, and that strategic decision-making that comes with that is really, really important to the individuals that we source. Uh, where possible, we look for evidence of budget responsibility and perhaps responsibility as a head of a functional area with that kind of um, budget responsibility falling on the, them individually. Um, we hugely value previous experience in the education, the educational charity sector, either as a governor at a school or, or uh, on an AG, uh, LGB in a charity or in another trust. So this can often demonstrate understanding of the challenges and governance structures that exist within education specifically, but also those challenges facing charities. And that, uh, that sort of experience we kind of hear from trust can be really impactful when people join a trust board. Often what will happen is that we'll find a candidate who's got good experience in other areas as listed here. And once we kind of add on that previous experience in, in a previous governor role or charity governor's experience, it really elevates that person's understanding and knowledge and expertise and, and kind of make for a really, really confident, competent candidate. Uh, so where we have consultants who come across our desk, so the, the, the applications from consultants or those who work on a consultancy basis, we really look for evidence of sort of the scale of their experience, really exposure to big value projects, high level reporting and ability to kind of understand the whole organisation perspective rather than just the part of a project that they might, they might be responsible for. In terms of diversity, we uh, at Governments for Schools, we're enormously proud of the work we do to help trusts and schools improve the makeup of their boards and encourage diversity in, in all its forms in every way. 
and Governors for Schools is even kind of predating the trustee recruitment service. Tr Governors for Schools has got a great track record in this area, uh, but we do obviously recognise that much more needs to be done. There's a lot of work to improve the sector in terms of representation and diversity, and we're really proud of kind of some of the numbers on the screen there that kind of demonstrate uh, from the last reporting year, so 2021 to 2022, uh, just over a third of all the candidates appointed to roles uh, were from a non-white British background. Um, and 29% uh, of the trustees, so all appointed volunteers as trustees, just under a third there were from non-white British backgrounds too. As we build the trustee pool, so the, pe the pool of people uh, potentially suitable for roles going forward, um, we so the, our uh, our data shows us that 45% of the trustee volunteers currently that we have in our pool waiting for roles, kind of looking for suitable roles, are under the age of 45, and just over 50% there are female and 22% from a non-white British background. So the, kind of the, the routes that we um, undertake to find uh, a diverse pool of candidates, uh, we work with uh, partners who have really kind of well-rooted and established um, diversity programmes within their organisations already, and look to partner where, with organisations that have that best practice embedded in what they do. And a lot of the, the imagery, the, um, the work that we do around our governor stories and our campaigns kind of really inform that as well. And we like to, to make sure that where that impact, impact is being made already in the sector, we're kind of championing that and, and demonstrating uh, that, that diversity brings the diversity of thought and diversity in all its forms is really beneficial to, to trust boards and making sure that there's that representation. As I say, we recognise there's kind of a lot to be done across the sector there, and we're a big part of contributing to that and, and learning lessons where they can be learned and actually being able to, um, to kind of demonstrate progress in diversity is really, really important in terms of uh, our candidate pools and, and our appointment figures too. A little bit on the volunteer trustees and the role that they play. I'm, I'm conscious of time and allowing enough time for any questions that do come in. So I'll just quickly rattle through some of these, just highlighting a couple of these points here for you. Um, so this is input. This the, this slide applies to volunteers appointed through our processes or through your own um, networks as well. Uh, and I think this can this kind of applies to, to all. So all trustee appointments made through the TRS, through Governors for Schools, are made solely by the trust through the mechanisms and the decision-making processes and protocols that you have in place. So that kind of appointment, <clears throat> excuse me, that appointment process is very much owned by yourselves, not by Governors for Schools, not the DFE, not anyone else. These candidates will be independent and experts in their field. Uh, and it's really important that you go through your kind of due processes when you appoint these individuals to make sure that they're the right fit for your trust, but also that they bring the right things that a, a, an independent trustee should do, sort of challenge and accountability and scrutiny for, to the executive and really sort of some challenge around decision making on the board too. So uh, a common misconception uh, may well be, I mean, I, kind of please do kind of shout them in the, in the chat too, but these people um, might be viewed as some sort of governance police um, dropped in to spy and snoop. This is categorically not the case. Um, all new trustees that are integrated to boards and committed to the ethos and success of the trust that they join. And we do a lot of work with the prospective candidates to ensure that their ethos and motivations are the right ones. I've talked about sticky appointments and also match to those trusts that they join. And sticky appointments are the best kind. We believe that in a huge majority of cases, thanks to a lot of the process, the steps that we do to find the right people for the right roles will result in appointments that last and the right changes made and the kind of the, the calibre and the robustness of the challenge that's brought by those individuals can really help to make sure that that's a, sort of a good match. Usually the people that are appointed won't be experts in school governance. They can be. Um, we, we are able to kind of source people who do have that background in ed the education sector and familiarity with school governance. And as I've talked about, people who've had previous roles in, uh, in governor roles, uh, that can be really beneficial. But a lot of the ex uh, expertise we'll find come from the corporate sector and charity governance, um, and that's more of a standard. Um, and if you're faced with a situation whereby uh, a trust requires intervention, this approach alone possibly isn't going to solve the problems that are being faced by a trust, but certainly they can help to kind of uh, address need. Moving on to the skills and expertise, again, conscious of time, and I'm apol apologies for the kind of the smallness of the fonts of this as I try to cram on so much content onto one slide. I won't th run through all of those, all of those boxes there, but suffice to say that the skills and experience required can be sort of vastly varied. Um, and I think we've seen just about everything ac across the years I've been working in this sector and working on trustee and governance recruitment. The key point to mention is that one in, in bigger fonts at the top, though, that all of the trustees should be required to take responsibility for all areas of a trust, not just the kind of the 
area, the skills area, the sector, the, the priority focus of their part of, of their knowledge and experience. There should be kind of a, a requirement to, to own all parts of, of good governance across all areas um, of, of the boardroom. Nuts and bolts of the process. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, a relatively simple process. You can start off by registering your requirements on our website, trustyrecruitmentservice.org.uk. Uh, and from that point on, on, I'll kind of not go line by line through this. You can you can kind of read the steps uh, for your information, but we will follow up uh, to coordinate that, that initial call um, for the chair or a designated member. It's really important that we work with a chair or a member as part of this. We recognise and appreciate that often there'll be a governance professional, a clerk, somebody else involved in perhaps help setting up the initial parts of this process, but we really require that chair or member involvement in order to kind of own the process and uh, and to, to, to have that ultimate accountability for appointment making process. Once we have everything finalised through that process, we kind of start the engines and launch that recruitment. We assess every candidate and conduct the screening calls before sharing expressions of interest in those individuals with the chair or the member leading the activity. And from that point on, should you um, decide that you want to speak to an individual, you can let us know and we can put that individual in contact with you to kind of commence the, um, the recruitment protocols and processes that you have in place in relation to interviewing DBS and the next steps. For, for recruitment and, um, and appointment. I mean, typically the time scale, sometimes how long is a piece of string, but typically we'd expect a process from initial kickoff to interview introduction stage to be eight to 12 weeks, dependent on the complexity of any one case, as it were, really. Uh, pricing, so as I mentioned, we're really sensitive to the fact that this is a challenge across the sector at the moment and appreciate that, um, that, that, that finances are stretched. The, just to kind of, Give a, give a, a moment or two to the pricing structure. So uh, for one appointment, two and a half thousand pounds, two appointments on a sliding scale, two appointments, the second appointment's two thousand pounds. So uh, two, and a, two and a half thousand in total, three appointments, six thousand pounds. So the critical point to mention here is the fact that uh, there's no payment required until after the introduction of a candidate. So you're not liable to pay anything until uh, you get a candidate that you're happy to take forward to interview and progress from there. And the second um, payment comes after the intent to appoint, appoint it. We're notified of that intent to appoint. So it kind of staggers a little bit of that, really, so that you can um, you can um, sort of plan out the, the process, as it were, really. And just to reiterate the point that as a non-profit, all of that fee directly goes to covering our costs in delivering the service. And that's very much in line with the service delivery costs uh, across the sector uh, and there's there's no kind of profit made from that and any surplus that goes from it is reinvested into the service delivery and improvement. So a couple of things to consider I know uh, there's going to be in the chat there's a there's a document that hopefully will complement this too in terms of a, a one pager on the service and some of the things that you to, for you to consider and think about when you're considering your trustee recruitment. Sometimes appointing two people can be easier than one uh, sometimes bringing two people onto your board can be helpful for that for those individuals, but also for you in terms of induction and processes. Complex cases, we sometimes do deal with complex cases where there's a lot of things going on, perhaps some governance failures. Where that's the case, when you come to us, please do let us know at the outset, not for any other reason other than it helps us to build that process from the very beginning and actually build that into what we're doing in our search activity. Because some of those are volunteers do like a challenge. They're, they're coming into this, they're offering their time, they, they want to volunteer because they want to make a difference. And sometimes actually having all that information at the outset will be what makes the difference to, to kind of uh, convince an individual to, to volunteer for your trust. And just to reiterate the thing around induction references and DBS are always handled by trusts. They will do some light touch betting, but usually they'll be handled by trusts. Uh, brief slide there, uh, just on the people involved in this. Uh, you recognise myself, uh, Scott and Anne on the right hand side of that slide as well. So Scott and Anne were regional advisors from the Cameron Ambassadors programme, really well known in the sector. You may be familiar with their faces. You may not be. If you may have worked with them in the past, but or dealt with them via phone calls. Uh, and Jill uh, also works with us on the team as well. So we're a small but perfectly formed team dedicated to trustee recruitment. And that is all of the kind of content here. I've run, I realize I've run up very close to the, um, the end of the time here. So let me just stop sharing very quickly so I can uh, have a look at the questions and see if there's any that, uh, that I can answer very briefly. Um, so, okay. So do you see a role for remote trusteeship? And if so, how do you recommend dealing with the pitfalls? Very much so, yeah. This is something that 
as expected, uh, came to the fore during the COVID pandemic. Uh, it's something that a lot of trusts actually found were beneficial uh, in the sense of getting more people around the trust table on a regular basis. And also it enabled us to do recruitment uh, that's and then we could broaden, the, broaden the, the net, as it were, and find people who maybe weren't within an hour's travelling distance, but could bring skills, knowledge and experience and expertise to support trust in the right way, rather than just being close by. As things move into a kind of hybrid way of working, we're finding that more trusts are going back to face to face, as we is, is right and is, as we'd expect. Uh, but we're finding that there's, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's an increasing number of trusts who are willing to kind of maintain that aspect of their, their delivery pitfalls of course there's that um, the less familiar, familiarity with the local area and the geographies that are facing trusts but certainly the, there's ways and means i think that trusts are finding to to overcome that and, and improve familiarity with the tr uh, with the trust locations i know we've got a few more questions in the chat there what we'll, i'll do is aim to take all of those questions i'll respond to all of those separately uh, in a document after the after the session uh, this has been recorded, as I say, and it'll be sent around in the next few days uh, to for kind of your access to, to kind of revisit and rewatch if you want to or share. Uh, thank you once again to IET for all of their support in delivering this, the, the, the sessions today. Please do use the hashtag in the over my shoulder. Uh, if you're tweeting about us, if you're using your socials, please do feel free to share all this information uh, far and wide as best you can. If you want to uh, more information, no obligation on trustee recruitment, please do visit the website trusteerecruitment.org.uk and we're very happy to have conversations with uh, anyone who wants to chat around trustee recruitment. Uh, all that's left to say is thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you being with us. Thanks for joining us for across these two days uh, and I hope to see, uh, hope to have conversations with you all soon. Thanks, man.